Thank you for listening to this download of Start the Week, presented by Bridget Kendall. Hello. We can be pretty sure what the Prime Minister is talking about with the presidents of Afghanistan and Pakistan at Chequers today, the planned pull-out of NATO combat troops and the dangers that it could lead to new turmoil in the region. But Afghanistan isn't the only worry. Last week, David Cameron was in North Africa, warning us of a new threat from Al-Qaeda-linked militants there, which he says could be with us for decades. So how easy is it to join up the dots between these different conflicts? Is it fair to say that the French intervention in Mali could be a new Afghanistan? And what can history teach us? I'm joined by the historian William Darimple, whose latest book offers some sombre lessons from the first time British forces went into Afghanistan. Najim Aslam's latest novel is set on the porous border between Pakistan and Afghanistan just after 9-11. Christina Helmich is a Middle East specialist who studies the reach and sweep of al-Qaeda. And political analyst Imad Mesdour brings Algerian insights into what's happening. Let's start with history and William Darimple with you and the lessons to be learned from the past in Afghanistan. Your new book, a return, The Return of a King, is about the first Afghan war in 1839 to 42. And probably most people in Britain have an idea that it was disastrous, but it's not a war we know about in detail. Yet in Afghanistan, it's part of the country's cultural memory. Everybody knows the heroes and the villains. It's their Waterloo. Correct. The first Anglo-Afghan war was this strange adventure um, that the British uh, had uh, under Lord Auckland to try and seize Afghanistan, which they saw as the crossroads of Central Asia. Um, There was, for the previous century, the British had been advancing up the Ganges, uh, north and west, at the same time as the Russians had been advancing southwards from the Orenburg Line. And anyone looking at the map could see that these two great land-based empires were going to meet somewhere in the middle. But the reality was that it was still many thousands of miles separating these two empires, and uh, there were many uh, emirates and khanates between them, and there was absolutely no immediate... Um, threat from Russia. But what you see is, 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 again, something that sounds very familiar to our own time. You see a a group of ideologically driven and ambitious hawks taking a single piece of intelligence, in this case a a, a single uh, uh, semi-official Russian envoy, Ivan Vitkovich, heading into Afghanistan. This one little nugget, which was like the kind of yellow cake, if you like, uh, of its day, is manipulated and stovepiped and played with. And within 18 months, this one envoy heading into uh, Afghanistan to open diplomatic relations with uh, Dost Mohammed Khan of Kabul is blown up into a kazus bela, into, into an excuse to invade Afghanistan. And initially, it's, it, everything goes very easily. The, 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 uh, the conquest is much easier than, than is expected, again, rather like what happened in 2002. Uh, and the British, in their overconfidence, build not an enormous fortress for their troops in Kabul, but just put up a series of tents in the plains outside Kabul, overlooked by uh, hills on all sides. And so when uh, when the jihad is finally declared a year and a half later, they're completely defenceless. They lose their weapons within and their food within a day. Their leader and their deputy leader is hacked to death and killed. And there's this desperate retreat through the icy passes, the high passes, the Tazin and, and Kod Kabul Pass, in the middle of, of winter. And the entire force, 18,000 men, women and children, of whom only 5,000 are actually soldiers, uh, are either butchered, shot, or in most cases die of uh, of frostbite. These sepoys from Bengal and UP who make up the East India Company army have no idea how to cope in the snow. Uh, And they get terrible frostbite. There are reports in the diaries of uh, their legs being like charred logs of wood. And yes, and, and there's that very famous painting, isn't there, of the last man staggering into the Dr. fort Bryden, in Kandahar. Uh, Dr. Bryden on his horse, exactly that. And, it, and it's, the truth is a little bit more complicated. There were a few Gurkhas who made it through subsequently and a couple of other people, a Greek merchant. But basically it's true that uh, at the end of the retreat, one man out of the 18,000 who left Kabul six days before, only one man made it through to Jalalabad. And it was, this was a defeat at the very peak of the Victorian uh, Raj's highest point of, of power. The British controlled more of the world economy than they ever had before, than they ever would again. And to the Afghans, it was like a miraculous 
completely miraculous defeat. They were they were disorganized. They were fractured. They had uh, no central command, uh, and uh, they had very primitive weaponry. The the, the long barrel jazels they were using were the same things that the Mughals were using two hundred years earlier in India. So this is a legendary victory which has gone down in history well, as it, how to much repel m- the occupier. Much more so than I think people realize. To the extent that the one of the Afghan resistance leaders, Wazir Akbar Khan, has the central diplomatic area of Kabul still named after him. Uh, and when I was retracing the route of the retreat a couple of years ago, uh, every villager knew the story. So sometimes the, you know, the story's a bit muddled. Sometimes they're muddled up with later Afghan wars. Um, but uh, the legend of the, of the British defeat and the scale of, of, of the defeat is the kind of founding myth of, of Afghan nationalism. And when Mullah Omar was threatened with an American invasion in 2002, he, uh, he said, do you want to be remembered to the troops? Do you want to be remembered as the sons of Dost Muhammad? In other words, the loyal, uh, what is perceived as, as, as the loyal, brave jihadis? Or do you want to remember, be remembered as the sons of Shah Shuja, by which he meant the sort of quislings, pro-Western puppets? So this is all very uncomfortable reading for the British, isn't it? Especially well, as you Also used... for Kaza, who read this book uh, <laughs> last read this week. Book. Yes, he did. I got reports from Kabul that he was reading it. Because he's obsessed with it. He's from the same tiny sub-tribe. And this is the weirdest thing of all. It is such a close replay. President Karzai uh, is from the Popolzai clan, which is a tiny sub-clan of the Durranis, as was Shah Shuja. And the people who brought down Shah Shuja, who were the the eastern Gilzai tribe, today make up the foot soldiers of the Taliban. So you can make a very good case for saying that this is merely the same tribal rivalries and same tribal wars, continuing with slightly different flags and slightly different puppeteers 170 years later. And Karzai hopes he's not going to be the puppet ruler who's deposed... Apparently he, he was up <laughs> reading this till 3am <laughs> when he should have been reading his briefing papers for America. So. So, so, <laughs> so echoes from the past, but what are the lessons then that the international community should be learning? Do you think, from I think there's a invasion? there's a whole lot of lessons. I mean, what's interesting, the, the, in a sense, the excuse for writing this story again, which has been written many times before in the past, was to look at it again um, with Afghan sources. I, I went through a whole series of trips uh, in Kabul, Kandahar, Herat, and, and Jalalabad, collecting the Afghan version of events, and there are nine full-length Afghan accounts of this war, as well as innumerable documents in in archives in Kabul, Lahore, and Delhi, and what you see is a very different picture from the picture in the traditional British accounts. I mean, there are many similarities, but there are important differences. Firstly, the Afghan resistance is far more fractious than the uh, than the um, British realise. Uh, there is a perception in the British cantonment that they're facing a, a mass walls of, of, of beards, fanatical beards. In reality, you have a whole lot of different groups with different motives, some of whom are very pro Shah Shuja. They just want to get the British out. Um, you also have this very clear sense that underneath this rhetoric of the jihad that you've got a whole series of much more complicated and much more worldly motives. There's a nice letter I found of Shah Shuja's in Lahore where he says these men, they use the language of religion, but actually all they want to do is enrich themselves. And again, this is something obviously which which uh, is, is very contemporary today. The, the, invoking the jihad is something that uh, that immediately gives you legitimacy, gives you support, but it doesn't mean that that's necessarily your whole motive. It doesn't mean it's also unimportant. I think there is a strong feeling that uh, that um, the Afghans do not want to be ruled by foreigners who have a different religion and a different set of moral values, but it is it is a, a, a cloak in which you can wrap yourself and give yourself this this, this aura of, uh, of, of, uh, of goodness. Uh, just like our own crusaders in, in, in the 11th century, you know, the, the, they went off to take Jerusalem. On one hand, they did want to liberate the Holy Sepulchre. On the other hand, they were after land and, 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 and estates. We'll talk a bit more about that in relation to North Africa in a moment. But uh, Nadim Aslam, you open your new book, The Blind Man's Garden, which is set contemporaneously, more or less, Absolutely. on this borderland mm-hmm. between Afghanistan and Pakistan mm-hmm. with the line, history is the third parent. Yes, absolutely. And that comes out of what William was just saying that, uh, you know, um, the idea that... Um, the, that 9-11 happened outside of history, you know, that that simply isn't the case, that it, William in his book goes back uh, into the 19th century, but as recently as 30 years ago, you know, there was this thing called the Cold War, which, uh, which was cold only for the privileged places of the planet. It got pretty hot over there in Afghanistan and Pakistan. And so uh, I wanted to write a novel which uh, would encompass this strange decade we've lived through, beginning with 9-11 and ending with the Arab Spring. And within that, we had um, 
the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq, the call to jihad, the war on terror, the murder of Benazir Bhutto, Guantanamo Bay, Abu Ghraib, um, the killing of Osama bin Laden. And this, this clash between an incomplete understanding of the East and an incomplete understanding of the West seems to have taken place. If you go to Google and type in Pakistan is, the last time I checked, the four autofill choices you were given were dangerous, evil, stupid, a terrorist country. Type in America is, and the choices you're given are not the world, evil, not a country, but a business. So the attempt was... No one does very well then. What did they say about the UK? I should should look it up. Um, So the attempt, I mean, as, as novelists, unlike historians or journalists, I can't tell anyone what to think. I can tell them what to think about. So what William was saying about um, that that he discovered these Afghan accounts of what the first Afghan war was like. Now, as, uh, as I said, that uh, we actually don't know the full story of what happened in, the, in this invasion, this Afghan war. In that, so the uh, part one of the novel is called Footnotes to Defeat, meaning that we thought that we had defeated them very quickly. We don't even know how that came about. So for me, the novel actually, uh, the official narrative of the war on terror that we know that the Americans went in, the NATO forces went in and they de- defeated the uh, the, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda within weeks. So that part of the war is over by 68 pages. Then I wanted to go and tell you, give you the footnotes di- that what happens to the body of um, uh, of a man who was found in a war, that body has to be taken back. The, did that man have a wife? Did that man have a, 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 a father? But did you think <clears throat> for your characters that this war, which William's describing in his book, that that's in the back of their heads, what happened in 1839 with the British... Is that that's resonating in their heads? No, abs- head. no, absolutely. Look, the name Malala is now, I think, known around the planet. So, because of this uh, young girl in Pakistan who who was shot at by the ta- by the Taliban. Um, now, the name actually comes from uh, a heroine of uh, in the Afghan history in the Second Afghan War, uh, in that she was again a teenager who helped in the battle against the British. So, and there are schools named after Malala, M- Malala Lai, that was her, her name. Schools, they, she's mentioned in textbooks, hospitals, etc. So to, if the British school children know about Waterloo, why is it such a leap to imagine that the children in Afghanistan and Pakistan won't know about their about their historical figures. This is about relations between, historical relations between Britain and Afghanistan. But there are wider historical resonances, aren't there? Christina Helmick, you study present-day al-Qaeda. Does, does William's book, do you think, help shed some light on how al-Qaeda was able to infiltrate so well into Afghanistan? It does. But I think the most important question that he asks is how do we, mem- how do we remember history? And also, how is history constructed? How how is history written? Whose voices are we listening to? Whom do we hear and, and whom do we ignore? I think um, if we take 9-11 as the starting point of the story of al-Qaeda in the West, we really didn't engage with the idea very much beforehand. Um, it's interesting to see that it was it was the voices that gave us the easy, the immediate answers that al-Qaeda is um, or bin Laden is, is fighting the West because of who we are, because of the way of life that we have in the West. But bin Laden, whom we didn't listen to, said very clearly, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not you we're fighting. It's not your way of life. It's not democracy. It's not your freedom we dislike. It's your foreign policy. It's your the effect, the consequences of what you do in Palestine, in Iraq, in Kashmir, and the suffering of the Muslim community. This is what this fight is all about, and this is the voice that we didn't hear. And I suppose this is also true in North Africa, isn't it? Imad uh, Mizdou, uh, North Africa, Algeria, the part of the world that you focus on, that you can be a bit selective about history and miss the important notes that can help you realise what's about to be around the corner, like what's happening in Mali today. Exactly. I think there's been a dominant sort of media narrative that picked up as soon as there was a French intervention in Mali. And a lot of the, the sort of narrative that's been presented to us is that these groups are sort of emerging out of nowhere 
uh, out of the sands of, of the Sahel. But I think for inhabitants of the region, this is very much a very old phenomenon, especially for Algeria. Uh, you know, in my country, these groups are people like Mokhtar bin Mokhtar, whose name have been uh, thrown around recently uh, as a result of the Ena Minas crisis. These are very well-known commodities in Algerian uh, recent history, uh, starting from the 80s and moving into the Algerian civil war throughout the 90s. A lot of the groups that we're seeing now in Mali that are operating have their roots in groups that operated in Algeria throughout the 90s, massacring hundreds of thousands of people. And, um, you know, there's actually a bit of resentment, I would say, even within Algeria, which is to say, you know, we were left alone as a country to deal with our problems for a decade, and the world is suddenly waking up to a threat and uh, telling us, you know, this is how you should deal with it in, in the war on terror. When you looked at William's book, did you see resonances there absolutely. that work for North Africa? Yeah, absolutely, and... Um, it actually reminded me a lot of the narrative that was presented not so much in recent history, Algerian history, but actually in the Algerian uh, revolution uh, against the French. You have a very similar narrative that emerges, you know, the cloaking of legitimacy and creating this national identity out of a rejection of the other. And um, the, the, the sense of martyrdom also is a very strong uh, parallel there as well. You say um, exactly. So I think we mustn't forget that some of these things are linked with the local politics of the of the areas as well. I mean, the Tariq Taliban uh, of Pakistan's spokesperson Esan uh, Esan has actually said that our fight is not with the Americans. Our fight is with the fellow Muslims, who are, according to him, not good enough Muslims, etc. So the struggle with them is that. <coughs> That, uh, it, th that's true, isn't it, William? It's a kind of tricky <clears throat> making this parallel because um, if you look at what happened in the 19th century, this was to a large extent about territory and power. Whereas if you look today, at, first there's the Taliban, then there's Al-Qaeda, which has a global aim. There's ideology. I mean, I know you said that it's uh, back then there's uh, the idea of ideology which can be a cloak for worldly motives, but there's something very different today, isn't there? Well, I think the same sense in which the closer you look, the more fractured these groups become is something which is very clear today, both in North Africa and, and, and in the rhetoric about Al-Qaeda. You have, last week, Cameron throwing around these, these, this rhetoric about large existential threats as if Al-Qaeda is some unified force controlled from a sort of James Bond bunker somewhere. In reality, as we all know, these are very disparate groups with very different motives, many of whom hate each other, many of whom have been fighting each other. Absolutely. Uh, and that uh, to try... And you, I think... We all should, after 10 years of this stuff, I mean, obviously 20 years or 30 years in the case of mm. Algeria, be instantly suspicious when a Western political leader starts talking in, in, in these sort of large rhetorical uh, phrases about uh, existential threats. What you're actually dealing with, as in Afghanistan, 19th century is individual groups with individual motives, often quite local. Christina? I, I couldn't agree more with that, actually. I think there is a real danger when we talk about the Islamist threat, as if there, if there was a monolithic entity out there that was threatening us. Al-Qaeda certainly had, Bin Laden had the agenda of um, fighting the US and the West, but ever since 9-11, um, the local groups that have sprung up have become increasingly engaged in local conflicts. We've seen this in Iraq, we've seen this uh, in Yemen, even, even in Yemen that we look at as the current center for Al-Qaeda, but it's actually the extent to which these groups are acting locally and are, have in a sense almost given up on the global agenda, paying lip service to it at best, that I think we, we need to keep in mind and not overreact. So when David Cameron talks about this global threat requiring a global response for decades, do you think that he's unwittingly reinforcing the notion of a unified th threat and kind of walking into a trap? How real is this threat? <laughs> Well, I think the statement was made against the backdrop of a, of a very big crisis and in the moment of crisis and the hostage taking was was awful and I think every 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 dramatic incident has to has the chance of triggering a really big response and I think that's what we've seen there um, but it would be to my mind for sure an overstatement to speak of the Islamist that for it, it completely ignores the fragmentation within Emma. well I, I I agree especially on the point that these are uh, groups that seem to uh, hijack local local grievances and and attach themselves to that to help their own economic interests. A lot of this, actually, what we're seeing now in Mali, has to do with the smuggling 
of cigarettes and drugs and making a profit out of the hostage taking, you know. And, and local pre existing grievances about of course, the place of the Tuareg and, exactly. and, and Mali. And, and the Tuareg and, cause uh, was, was hijacked very early on. The Tuareg on. is uh, they're the tribes in the north of Mali. Yeah. And, 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 and throughout the region. for a long time. Exactly. And the Tuareg, this isn't the first time that there, there's been a Tuareg rebellion. There was one in 1962, there was one in the 90s. And so lo- local grievances, local problems have not been addressed by these countries that are very fragile economically. There are power vacuums in these countries. And these groups have managed to sort of hijack that cause as a result. And, and they were also encouraged, obviously, by the sort of mass proliferation of weapons in Libya and the open space, you know, again, to draw the parallel with Afghanistan. The open space that the Sahara provides is almost like a safe haven for these groups that are able to sort of move around in a very fluid way. Uh, but uh, one thing I did want to mention, actually, was about uh, uh, c- Christina's point about whether or not it's a threat or not. I actually think it is a big threat. Uh, You're talking uh, about North Africa now. Actually, to, 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 to world security, but because it actually threatens economic interests uh, of Western powers in the region, but it also threatens the political development of these societies. It's actually stalling a process uh, that is very needed. For example, we mentioned the, the Tuareg problem. Uh, because of this crisis now, the sort of handling of the Tuareg issue has been put to the side and so we're not going to be discussing any transition or any political transition for quite some time until we've dealt with this problem so I I do I actually do think it is a little bit of a threat you're shaking your head Christina yeah I'm not sure I can agree with that completely um, I think the, the, the threat to the international security is, is overstated in so far uh, as that we're overstating the economic interests and economic interests only benefit those who, who gain from those interests and this is not global not universal in fact there are far more losers than winners in this game of, of international capitalism so I N- Najim, I wanted to bring you back in here because in your novel, The Blind Man's Garden, what you do is give us a view from below, uh, not just the political overview, but Absolutely. ordinary people <clears throat> and Absolutely. how they, in a kind of confused and bewildered and rather grim way, Absolutely. process these big mm-hmm. events that are happening around them. Mm-hmm. In that way, do you think what Imad is saying about North Africa has a resonance? Well, the thing is that we are talking about um, uh, groups here. And now, uh, as a novelist, my interest is always the individual rather than the group. And uh, I, uh, so we have to understand uh, how these narratives which are out there, how they are re- received by one individual and how the kids are going to respond. In, uh, in uh, this week's uh, New York Review of Books, there's an essay by Steve Cole about uh, Zero Dark Thirty. And he says that, 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 uh, and that the danger here is that we have to think how all this torture on the screen is going to be seen by uh, the ordinary Muslims around the world, whether or not it did happen or not, or not happen. So that is the thing. I I spent a lot of time in the madrasas when I was in Pakistan, and and I spoke to young kids, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen years old, and one of them said this extraordinary thing for me, which is actually in my previous novel, which is that he says that these days they keep saying, why do Muslims become suicide bombers? They must be animals. There are no human explanations for their actions. But does no one remember what happened on board flight United 93? A group of Americans, civilized peoples, not barbarians, discovered that their lives, their country, their land, their city, their traditions, their customs were under attack and they decided to risk their life and eventually they gave up their lives in order to prevent the other side from succeeding. Is he wrong when he thinks that this is a lot like what the Muslim martyrdom bombers are doing? This is the fourth flight from 9-11. Exactly. Where the passengers took over and stopped it. Exactly. So we then have to ask this person this question, well, is Islam and Pakistan, etc., in that immediate a danger, in that in in the next four minutes, it's going to be destroyed. But these were his uh, explanation and that is why he said, I am here. That so, is why so I am I suppose, So the, this kid, uh, whose education level, what we would call here, was I think O-levels. So, you know, he wasn't very sophisticated, but it is a perfectly logical way of thinking. William, William I, I just like to do my kind of fan moment here. I, I just want to say how much I loved uh, Nadim's 
novel and his work in general. And this, the extraordinary mixture of, of poetry and violence, which you've been doing, which is so authentic to, to this part of the world, where both do coexist in a very strange you way. See, that's interesting and, you say yeah. this part of the world, because what I was wondering when you were talking, and you get inside in your novel, inside the mind of someone who's been radicalised, mm -hmm. perhaps with not very much information, is that process the same in other parts of the world? Christina, you've met um, young Iraqis in Yemen, haven't you, who became radicalised. Is it the same process? Or are we talking, if we're talking about local conflicts and local reasons, I, is, there, is there not a global pattern to this? I, I, think, it's, I think it's difficult to say there is, is one pattern that fits all. I think it is a very individual story, and people have so many different experiences. And it's a, it's a process of, you know, when does somebody reach the decision of... of uh, or the conclusion that b taking violence is the only the only option left. And I think there can just be too many stories that leave up to that. It could be about, you know, we, we talk a lot about poverty, for example, yeah. but that doesn't really hold up. It's people in search <coughs> for meaning. Um, the, the hijackers of 9-11 all were very affluent people. Yeah. It's, the, it's the loss of meaning in yeah. people's life, I think, that is more important. That can come from so many different sources. It's Looking, um, going back to Afghanistan again, what was lovely with the Afghan sources that turned up for this book was being able to do exactly what Nadim's talking about, find the individual. When, in the British accounts of the Afghan uprising of 1842, you get this impression of, of, of this sort of just fanatical, bigoted mass of, 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 of sort of barbarians trying to overwhelm civilization. But with the Afghan accounts, you can suddenly get in, into individual minds and into individual motivations. So rather than just the, the call to jihad, which is all you get in, in the British accounts, you get, for example, one guy, Abdullah Khan Achaksai, who's a young nobleman, whose girlfriend is seduced by the British deputy resident, Alexander Burns. You get another guy, Aminullah Khan Lugari, who's had been thrown off his lands in, in British land reforms. Uh, and and you, you get a local um, Naqshbandi peer uh, who's tried to surrender, and when he's trying to surrender, another bit of the British army goes and bombs his... Uh, goes and shells his... Um, uh, his his uh, kila his fortress uh, and reduces it and kills his his wife and children so the more detailed you go and the more analysis you do suddenly individual motivations suddenly individual stories come and i think this is something that needs to be looked at throughout and, and always be suspicious of any politician that starts using this this sort of great sort of you know with us or against us rhetoric that we we're getting in in the in the bush and blair era picking up on that point uh, right. i think i think also rebellion and this sort of Joining these groups provides individuals. Uh, I, I did this. I studied this uh, in the Algerian case throughout the '90s. Actually, these groups actually provide a source, a sense of uh, of legitimacy to people, and it creates. Uh, don't forget, there's a sort of social ladder that that enables them to climb. You have you have people who are bus drivers who become emirs, mm -hmm. which which is you know sort of a, a very noble uh, a rank in that region. So they go from alienated deprived individuals, whether that's economically, socially, or politically, and whether they face repression or not, can actually lead them to push towards these groups or go towards these groups. And then you have the agenda, as William was saying earlier. People are, the ideology, the narrative, uh, allows for people of different backgrounds, different types of deprivation, to, to find coalesced interests. And so that provides it's them It's so hard, difficult to hold that in mind, isn't it? When you think about Al-Qaeda and its global ideology and it, the global presence and it's a, a, this message of whether it's to inspire awe or fear. And yet, what you're saying, Imad, is if you look inside, as you did in Afghanistan in the last century, you find all these different people with motivations. Christina? I think it, it, it just makes me um, wanting to um, address the issue of, of, of terrorism and what terrorism is. Um, we have always we, we tend to deal with the we, t we tend to label individuals as terrorists thereby taking away the legitimacy of what they actually have to say and we treat terrorism as if it is the cancer that we need to cure um but I think if we step away from that maybe a simplistic notion and see terrorism more as a problem of um, legitimacy and political leadership and who has the right to use violence in the international system, I think we can come to a much better understanding of of what the debate is really all about. And also the point you made earlier, Christina, about uh, people coming from various backgrounds and uh, the 9-11 hijackers were middle class, so it was said about them that, well, they can't have been that affected by uh, uh, by the poverty of their land if they were middle class. So, so what grievance is? But of course, I think that idea is strange that once you be become part of the upper layers of the society, you stop caring about what is happening. I think in, in a way, you, you would be more informed, you would be uh, educated, and you would be more... Uh, you know, more upset about it. Having said all that, 
to be specific about uh, the 9-11 hijackers, I mean, um, uh, the thing to understand is that it was a pretty big decision to actually kill yourself and kill thousands of other people. And I think it is my, I believe that despair has to be earned. So I want to see what did Muhammad Atta and his friends do before they arrived at the decision that the only thing we can do now is to kill ourselves and thousands of other people. I would like to see a record. So that too can be quite easy to actually the violence you you're talking about terrorism that too we we, we have to be careful that uh, the weapon is not the first thing that uh, uh, bring it back to the people and what's going on in their heads exactly no um, as i said i would like to see a record of what Muhammad Atta did before and in in trying to change this, the situation as it were because and then if after 50 years of struggle he can here, here, uh, he arrives at the idea that now I'm going to do this spectacular thing, and uh, that is the only way I can do it. I will, you know, um, be slightly sympathetic towards what he's saying. Well, can, can we just talk a bit more about Al Qaeda, Christina? Um, because some of the tactics that they learned in Afghanistan have now <coughs> been transferred to other parts of the world, most notably recently the deserts of North Africa. And the question is. Is there one agenda? We, we've talked about the local and the global, but were they? Was it? Was it like some people have said? It's like a puddle that <laughs> the West put its army boot into 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 the puddle in South Asia, and then all the all all the drops scattered into different places. But is it still a coherent structure network, or actually, is it is it something that we should look at country by country in order to understand how to tackle it? A really important question and the agendas are multiple. I think it started out with bin Laden's global jihad agenda, but it has become it has become very fragmented and, and in different individuals in different locations have interpreted it as meaning something in in a very different way. So for example for um Zakawi in um the leader of Al Qaeda in Iraq until his death, um took this to mean that fighting the Shia population was the way of, of establishing the caliphate. That is that is a very far uh, stretch of the imagination from what bin Laden uh, advocated about overcoming rifts within the Ummah and, um, and advocating unity within Islam. So uh, the same, and, and that has actually prompted him, uh, Bin Laden, to uh, try to interfere and say, "Look, um, what you're doing is counterproductive. We need to we need to focus on what the real is." But the reality is one of fragmentation and differences. I think the important point to realise, if you're a Western policymaker, is the degree to which that fragmentation can uh, can be brought together by a clumsy Western response that you have fragmented groups. And this is, again, the case in, in 19th century Afghanistan, that you have completely exactly. disparate groups. But if the, the West goes in very heavy-handedly, uh, very insensitively, and uh, alienates the local population and, does, and, 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 go, and, and makes a whole variety of mistakes in its response to this, that is the only way that you can bring this fractious group together and face a real threat. And so we have to be very, very careful, particularly with this latest intervention in Mali, that we're not going to suddenly Absolutely. face a united force in, in four, three or four years down the line if we misplay our hands. The French president would say, what else are we to do? Have these people march on the capital? Well, on. yeah, I, I mean, in, in Mali, you have that exact situation that William is talking about, where you have so many groups. You have Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. You have Mujao, which, have, which has more West African focus. You have Ansar Adin, which are sort of Islamized Tuareg, let's call it that way. You have uh, Mulathimin Biddam, which is the recent group that appeared out of nowhere in the in Aminas crisis. So all these groups have different agendas, and they actually, and you have internal politics. And the difficulty, I'd say, for, for, for uh, Western powers now intervening in Mali beyond the, the, the winning short battles and uh, in, in a long war against these groups is actually understanding the politics within these groups mm -hmm. and understanding their ties because they're very embedded into the local populations, by the way. These groups, part of the legitimacy, they don't necessarily have a, fo a, a, a foothold in those regions, but part of their legitimacy hails from them mixing with the local populations through and marriages and business interests, etc. And that's something that hasn't been discussed at all by Western uh, leaders. And speaking against um, uh, no, novelistically, um, one of the things that I think what Al-Qaeda Al has achieved is, um, looking at the Pakistani and Afghanistani situation, is this sort of interna internationalization of the suicide bombing. 
that wasn't there that that thing wasn't there i mean uh before 911 not to the extent that it is now uh in the in the last decade upwards of 40000 people have died in pakistan and any number of them have been caused by the by the suicide bomber as it was in the 1980s during the the soviet jihad in afghanistan there uh, if you remember th there is a very famous and very important tunnel called the salang tunnel uh, through which the russian supplies were coming in now the only be and be uh, and because it was a very important route uh, the mujahideen and the CIA wanted to destroy it. But because it was important, it was very well guarded by the Soviets. So the CIA suggested to the Mujahideen that we need to carry out a suicide bombing. Someone could take a truck and go in and blow it up. The Afghans were appalled by the idea because in Islam, one of the biggest sin is uh, suicide. That uh, actually to lose hope is a sin in Islam. So they were appalled so much so that uh, the CIA flirted with the idea of bringing in suicide bombers from Sri Lanka. Right. So uh, since 9-11, that idea seems to have gone because before it was suicide bombing, now it is martyrdom bombing. So Okay, I hadn't heard that allegation about the CIA before, but bringing this back to North Africa uh, in mud, you know, it's a problem, isn't it? Because if you get drawn into a military conflict, as the French would say they have in Mali, mm -hmm. well, then you have the problem that you were talking about, William, that you alienate the population. Yeah. But what do you, you to do you do? How do you get out? Yeah, the French have been out? in that's Chad for 45 years. How they, do you they went in and said it was going to take a couple of weeks, just like this one. But that, that's the problem. It's, it's the short-sightedness, isn't it, of, 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 of intervention. Uh, the same way that you have a franchise, an Al-Qaeda franchise almost now, with like a, a <coughs> business model that's being replicated throughout uh, countries in Africa, you also have... Uh, you also have a franchise for intervention. If I think the best metaphor to, for Mali is the French intervention right now. Uh, I've been, I've heard this uh, being floated around. Is that uh, it's almost as if they cut the tree. Now they have to get rid of the stump and the roots. And th these groups haven't just melted away. The problems are still there. And to deal with that is going to take far more than just boots on the ground. And where are these roots spreading now? Because it's not just in Mali, is it? Other countries in the region are also nervous. Nigeria has its own Islamist problem. Exactly. You have the Boko Haram problem, which is obviously another th threat, That's or at Nigeria. least a perceived threat. Uh, but you, the regional, s the states in the region, Mauritania and Niger, are equally fragile, have similar populations, and fear a, a, a contagion, let's call it that way. And so Western powers, part, I guess part of the uh, intervention uh, logic is to actually stop the problem from reaching countries like Niger, which are essential to uranium supplies. Christina? I think it, it would be important. I mean, we talk about finding solutions, but I think it's important also to question our ability to in, to um, to control events beyond our own state borders. I think we need to have more modesty as it comes to that. If we have learned anything from, from William's work, then I think we we need to be much more modest and um, we talk about being successful in um, in Mali I don't know what that's even supposed to mean to me this is much more of an inter-Muslim debate that we have limited influence over from the outside after 9-11 I went to Kohat in the uh, in the tribal territories which is exactly the area that uh, Nadim is writing about and I interviewed this lawyer Javid Pasricha who was uh, in involved in taking Al-Qaeda um, refugees who come out from Tora Bora, mm -hmm. these, these women and children hurt by the daisy cutters. And he'd anyway been taken away and tortured after, after taking them in in Kohat. And I went to interview him, and he quoted one of the leaders of 1842 at me then. And he said, um, you can bring an army in, but how do you expect to get it out again? And this is the great question we've got to grapple with now before we start committing more troops to Mali and to everything else. You can go in these very easy... You, you, people for years with these problems have been saying, just go in, you do a bit of regime change, you knock them around a bit, then you get out. In reality, you get sucked in, it gets terribly expensive, and you can be in there for years. It's all very well to criticise um, the NATO operation in Afghanistan or the French going into Mali. But if, partly by design, Al-Qaeda-related Al groups draw you in and create the situation where you have to send in troops to stop some sort of cataclysm. I mean, what do you do about that, Christina? That's going to be, that's, that's, that's the tactic, isn't it? Well, I think we need to remember that a lot of the, a lot of, that Al-Qaeda as such, Bin Laden's agenda started with being a resistance to, to Western intervention to begin with. 
I mean, that that is the, you know, it's trying to find a walking the very fine line between trying to protect our interests, but also not being seen as the bully. Well, Imran, what do you think? Well, uh, l- if, looking at m- the specific case of Mali, uh, I think, uh, and I'm not justifying the intervention, but th- there was there was a danger, an imminent danger against Bamako and Western interests, and so Western leaders uh, had to intervene because you have such a massive gold supply in the south, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the mining interests, etc., for the French. Well, it's but not just that, is it? It's, it's, it's not it's just also that. The, the human, there is a human rights element here. If you listen to the people who've been interviewed since the French have gone in, quite a lot of them are of really course. relieved not to be facing and, um, yes, the, uh, the more brutal aspects of, of Sharia law. No, no, law. of course, because you had a brutal application of Sharia law in the north of Mali and people were suffering. So there are obviously going to be a, a whole host of reasons for that, that justify to a certain extent uh, a, a, a very needed intervention but the question is really I need to hammer this point forward is looking at how you get out because you know it was easy to intervene for example in Libya and call for regime change and protect the civilian population at least that was the narrative presented but the consequences of Libya are actually what we're seeing now in Mali you know the, the proliferation of weapons when if you do if you do not if you go in with a short-sighted objective, which is getting rid of a regime, as William was saying, is sort of moving the pieces around in a very awkward kind of way, without looking ahead at the consequences. You have to look beyond the national problems and look at the region, look at the implications. Another issue I, I, I just want to highlight is also the humanitarian cost this is actually going to play out in the region. Uh, you have 200,000 people that have been displaced as a result of this uh, the, the crisis in Mali. How is that going to play for re- countries like Mauritania and Niger? that have absolutely no way of absorbing these populations. You're breeding even more. Western resentment. governments would say the way to get out is what's happening in, Af- in, in Afghanistan. These talks today in Chequers try and create a re- reconciliation programme so that you end the conflict that way. Well, again, this is what happened in, in, in 1842, that you end up with the same people that you, you sent in the army to us, coming back again to uh, Dost Mohammed Khan, who was the guy we fought and, and got rid of, in the end ended up back in power. The okay. same could happen in Afghanistan today. That's where we have to end it. Thank you to all my guests. Imad Mizdua, a political analyst at Pasco Risk Management. Christina Helmick, who will be giving a talk at the University of Hull on whether Al-Qaeda, the future of the Islamist threat next month. Nadim Aslam's The Blind Man's Garden and William Dalrymple's Return of the King are both out now. Next week, physicists take over Wall Street and the lure of big data. Lisa Jardine will be here to discuss the algorithms with Marcus de Sotoy, James Owen Wetherill and Kenneth Couquier. But for now, thank you. And goodbye. There's more information about Start the Week on the programme's website. Go to bbc.co.uk where you'll also find many more Radio 4 programmes you can download for free.